All right, welcome everyone to Systems Thinking Ontario number 119. Um, pretty impressive. So this session is called What Can Systems Thinking What Can Systems Thinkers Learn from Music City Making? And we'll have uh, Adam and Zayan with us. But before we uh, give them a chance to introduce themselves, in typical systems thinking fashion, we'll uh, basically go around and introduce uh, ourselves. You can maybe respond to the prompt. Um, what brings you here today? So I'll just call out the different um, folks on my screen. Uh, and when I call your name, you can unmute and just uh, describe a little bit about yourself and then we'll start the session. So I'll start with Ken Little. Hi, so I'm joining, I'm Ken Little. Uh, I think what brings me into sound and music is I lead a lot of sound meditations with interesting instruments, including very large gongs, like over a hundred pounds style of gongs. And what I'm really interested in, in terms of Music City, I recently moved out of Toronto, uh, but to actually a very musical small town, Westport, Ontario, uh, and around Kingston, which also has a thriving music scene for its size. And so it was really kind of interesting what, uh, what kind of things can go into that and make those sustaining as well. Wow, very cool. Very, very topical. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, Don Officer, you can introduce yourself. What brings you here this, this evening? Hey, Don, uh, just to, you can unmute yourself and then you might yeah, not. There we go. go. Didn't take the first time. Yeah, I enjoy music a lot, but um, it's, I seem to be impervious to being able to learn much about it. <clears throat> Something which was discovered when I was still in elementary school. But um, on the other hand, uh, I'd like to know what the connection is to systems. There's some obvious connections, right? But beyond that, um, what should we know? What could we learn? What? How might it help us? Absolutely. Thank you, Don. Yeah. Um, Francesca Beeler. Yeah, I actually just put in the chat, I'm logged in under my partner's name, who I often come to these meetings with, Francisca. Uh, my name is Sean Patrick Stenzel, though. Uh, Francisca may come later. Uh, as the regulars know, I work in the environmental field, so I'm interested in, in systems thinking. To the question earlier, why I'm interested, I used to be a, a musician before I had carpal tunnel from typing too much at work. Um, so very interested in this. I was having some interesting convos on the weekend as to how Toronto used to be a better music city in a way. And I think it's partly because of the high rent and you have to work to live now. So interested in to see if some of my hunches were maybe borne out in the conversation. So happy to be here. Over. Yeah, wonderful. I think I think we'll definitely be touching on uh, some of those themes. Thank you for joining. Uh, next time, my thumbnail here is Penny. Okay, Penny signaling something. Did you say Penny? I did. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, you know, I'm here because I really like the description, and like Dawn, I'd, I'd like to know uh, what it has to do with educational cybernetics. Um, I'm self-employed, and I practice educational cybernetics. And I, I apologize, but I'm going to have to spend the next 10 minutes trying to make my headphones work because I can hardly hear any of you, and it's really interfering with my enjoyment. Sounds good. Thank you, Penny. Um, next up is Elena. Hi. Um I'm just um, looking forward to learning more about it. Um, I've been at some cybernetic things that uh, were based on music and music theory and how it has an impact on the local economy. So I'm curious to learn more. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Daniel. Hi, everyone. Uh, Daniel here. Um, yeah, I just came across this event like today <laughs> and um, I was able to make it and and Zad, you and I have, have worked together in the past and um, and uh, so it's great to see you and, and I saw you were putting on this event and I'm a musician myself. Uh, I saw this event was going till 830 and unfortunately I have to leave a little early because I have my own band rehearsal to get to. Um, but yeah, no, I'm just curious about music and systems and um, I work at the city of Toronto now, so if there's anything I can glean and take back to my work, um, I'd love it. So thanks for having me. Nice. Awesome. Good to see you, Daniel. And 
Yeah, I definitely think we'll touch on some of the Toronto Music City vibes. Um, Tyler, Craig. Uh, I'm going to answer for Tyler because yeah, I, I invited him actually. This is an area that he'd be interested in, but he's unable to participate because he's not in a place where he can talk right now, but I wanted to yeah. tune in anyway. Okay. Wow. Very impressive ventriloquist <laughs> skills there. That's that's awesome. Um, second last, uh, David Ng. Hi. Um, regular at System Thinking Ontario. Before I played electric bass, I learned high school oboe, which tells you a lot of personality. Um, oboists are weird people. Awesome. Um, and my name is Zad Khan. I'm, I'm the host for today. I, actually, uh, at a certain point, I'll be taking out and David will be uh, co-hosting as well. And I may take, take back in uh, this evening just as a heads up. Um, but I'm an SFI graduate. I came to Systems through Okaju University, and I've been supporting Systems Thinking Ontario, just organizing these sessions. And we're often trying to um, find interest and connections between fields outside of systems to learn, to ask ourselves what we can learn from those fields. So two of my friends uh, from SFI here, Adam Hogan and Zayan Hussain, are joining us today. Um, and I'll, I'll let you both give a little bit of an introduction to yourselves, but maybe to prompt that introduction, I'll merge it with the question, which is, you know, you know, we asked, we, we start out with the topic of music cities. And I would, I would be curious to ask you both, uh, how did you both come to a music and music cities? And can you maybe unpack, um, you know, that term or that field or that, that area of, of, of study, so to speak, um, maybe Adam and Zion, you can kind of start. Sure, sorry, just trying to unmute myself. I want to apologize also, my dog is in the room, so you might hear weird dog noises in the background <laughs> at some point. Um, but yeah, my name's Adam. I uh, actually don't really work in this field other than I uh, did my MRP in the SF SFI program on music cities uh, because it's a, a great interest of me. Um, I have always loved music, but I am not a musician and feel like, it just doesn't come naturally to me, or even with hard work, it just is not something that is great, something I'm great at. But I've always been a fan of music and and live music in pretty much any capacity. I'll check out pretty much any sort of performance, um, whether that's someone busking on the street or going to checking out the symphony, which is not usually my thing but if someone you know I had some friends suggest before to go and I've gone and it's very impressive so I'm just someone who really loves music and the impact of music and the way that music is used to uh, communicate so many different things and used to facilitate so many different things so uh, I guess I'm just a music lover in short and you can usually find me at a show or I enjoy record shopping or pretty much always just listening to music perpetually so um I also have a degree in geography, and so this has been, that's an area of great interest to me as well. So music and music cities really sort of, it made sense as a way in, uh, or not really a way in, but something to explore further. And that's something, I think I, I don't know how I came across the topic of music cities, really. I just was thinking about music and cities, and sort of this came my way. Um, and that's why I decided to focus on it for my major research project. And that project largely focuses on, uh, well, in short, the importance of, uh, or the critical role of free music in public space as it helps to uh, create and strengthen social infrastructure. Um, and then also kind of looks at how we can help music exist more freely in cities as well. So not only is it but free music, but allowing music to act more freely. Um, I think that is all your questions, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, no problem. We'll, okay. we'll build on that. We'll let, let Zayan, you know, um, jump in on and respond to some of that. Zayan, what's your relationship or your interest to one music and two music cities? And if you want to, you know, continue the conversation of unpacking that, that topic. Yeah, for sure. Um, music is been a love of mine since I was a kid and I've been playing and working with music for about 20 years now and I started in Bangladesh first organizing concerts the first one was at a fried chicken restaurant and then growing up to working with Pepsi the U.S. Embassy and working with large-scale um, like flood relief programs um, promoting the English music scene in Bangladesh and developing music community over there 
And then that after I moved to Canada, started working a lot with music here, like um, composition, recording, performing with different artists. And then I got into um, product design and music as well, working with companies like Eventide Audio. So it's like, a, for those who aren't familiar, it's like a 50 something year old company. They're one of the inventors of digital delay. Um, they're used for films, music, and a lot of top studios around the world. And so many of my favorite artists use them. So it's like a wild trip for me to be involved with products there. So I've worked on a few there, um, ship with my presets and whatnot. And so the performance side has been going for a while. Um, and when it comes to music cities, it was an evolution of the work I was doing with music, with community. And coming to Toronto, I found a lot of gaps compared to other cities that I get to do work in, like New York, Los Angeles, and even throughout Asia. And there are so many, even though Toronto has all the foundations, it has all the makings of a great music city. And it's a major tour market for most bands who are doing like an East Coast, North American tour, and internationally and within North America. So I was surprised at how come it's not sticking? How come it's not gelling here where even Bangladesh, we could make something grow. So I got into it peripherally from there. So I spent a lot of time going to like North by Northeast, Canadian Music Week, slowly building up um, locally here. Um, and then I started doing some projects with the city of Toronto. So Daniel, we, we should definitely chat afterwards. So work with um, a number of folks there on different projects, looking at uh, post-COVID revitalization, looking at the youth cultural um, incubator stabilization initiative with a lot of organizations like House, which is like the weekends, the musical artist, the weekends parent labels, parent company, um, remix project. And right now looking at the cultural hotspots program within the city of Toronto. So it's like a number of different ways. Plus I compose for art installations, um, different things. So music is kind of all around and I'll, I don't want to keep rambling about it. So we'll, more examples will come up as we go through. Yeah, no, no problem. I think one of the things maybe to kick us off now that we have a better understanding of how you both are coming to this is Adam, you're Adam and Zayan, both of you are just, Adam, you're describing music cities as making music uh, more available. And I wonder, like, maybe you could both help the audience understand the rise of this term, like both its descriptive form, like a music city, you might think of Chicago, you might think of Paris, but then there seems like there's a concentrated effort, music cities as like almost a, a policy goal, so to speak. I don't know if I'm using the right term, but can you both maybe help the audience here and myself like unpack that a little bit? What is, how did this come about? Why, why does there seem to be a concentrated effort and how does that differ than what naturally emerges in, in, in the memory or in certain urban spaces? Adam's thesis was on this, so he should. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll reach back a little bit to remember. Um, I think it really comes first from a couple of cities sort of branding themselves as, you know, as music cities, so like Nashville, or like live music city, like Austin. Um, and it's uh, kind of just based in that, I think it was marketing, as far as marketing goes and tourism goes, I think that's where it came from um, when you're thinking of the term. But I think like the infrastructure was already there in those places um, and the variety of scenes, the types of music, obviously it's around largely in, in those places, live music or uh, music industry. Um, Nashville obviously has a lot of both. and. Austin, you know, has South by Southwest, and it's just been a music hub, especially in the southern U.S. for quite a long time. Um, so the history is there, but I think there are also people who have been sort of developing this over time from a diff a number of different angles, and you can come into music cities from just about any way that you come into the idea of cities. Uh, you know economic, social, cultural, like whatever your entry point is into the concept of what a, what a music city is or what a, what even a city is, you can enter into music cities that way. So it does exist in a lot of dimensions. Um, but I think if we're looking at sort of what the term, where the term music cities largely comes from, I think it's from those consultancies and uh, companies that are helping cities develop, I guess, more from a tourist, tourist, tourism and marketing, branding sort of perspective. Um, and that's not to knock it at all. I think those are really important aspects of it. And that's the easy sell on for cities anyway. Um, and some of those consultancies like Sound Diplomacy, like Sound Music Cities, their focus isn't just on 
marketing and tourism. Um, I think that's where cities try to, where they find those places, but they all also uh, focus on the multi-dimensional aspect of music, largely with the economy being at the forefront. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, go ahead. The, the term music cities, as it goes around, tends to often be rooted in economics, like building on what Adam's saying, even though it has music in the name and the art form, sometimes the focus winds up being on tourism and the like. But the way I try to define music cities, um, you've got your historical examples like Los Angeles, Chicago, New Orleans, all to start with, and at a later point, Austin. But they typically have a few things in common. It's like they've got a lot of musical heritage, diversity. They've got a supportive music industry infrastructure that extends across the value chain. So looking at recording studios, labels, educational institutions, and other businesses related to the value chain that would support with artist development and nurture. And from this, you know, from a systemic standpoint too, it's like a, mu a successful music city has like an intersection of three key pieces. One is um, the ability to create quality supply of artists. So as I mentioned, the artist education programs, nurturing artist development programs, to be able to create quality demand. So to be able to have the channels for artists to be able to get the word out about themselves, but also have venues and infrastructure to showcase their performance, whether it's through streaming, broadcast, live, and the like. And the last is to have quality curation mechanisms that can help filter through all the different types of music. And all, because nowadays, like we're talking Spotify, right? Like you have a hundred thousand songs coming out a day. And how do you expect people to actually navigate that in any meaningful way? Given if one of the big hallmarks of music industry in the past has been, there've been a lot of gatekeepers and protection measures, um, very limited supply through radio, like you're limited by number of hours, number of channels, but we've seen this democratization in recent years that has kind of flipped industry models on its head. And that's kind of like leads to the music, this idea of music cities as well becoming so much more important because um, like you have so many factors that lead to success of the art, like quality of supply of art also leads to things like the housing market, um, leads to things like your urban infrastructure that would support your artists, the music stores having a wide amount of supply and selection. Yeah, like I'll, I'll stop there because no. the ramble can go on forever. No, that's fantastic. I think both of you are, are describing how many, how many topics Music Cities intersects with. Um, and maybe I just want to maybe I just want to bring the audience in here about like just based off of what Adam and Zion are sharing so far. Uh, over to anyone from the audience. Do you have any thoughts about the relationship to Music Cities and all these diverse kind of um, dependencies that it has? Or does anyone have any relationship or opinions on Music Cities or questions for, for both? David? I have a question about um, artists and living in a city as expensive as Toronto, mm -hmm. uh, which I think has to be one of the big challenges, right? Because but on the other hand, you just you said, you know, talking Los Angeles, that's expensive. Chicago, expensive. Nashville is not really expensive. And Austin is kind of maybe in the middle. So um, how does that impact um, the ability to maintain a or keep a music city living? It's tough because there's a distinct correlation between like an art scene and how thriving it is compared to housing prices. And we find that like even in Los Angeles, I find Los Angeles, I've spent a lot of time there and it, the cost of living there feels way cheaper than Toronto at this current point in time. And we're looking at these cities like in the heyday. So in the heyday of Los Angeles music scene, housing prices were cheaper. You look at cities like Berlin, where housing prices have only recently started to skyrocket. And there's a distinct link between the cost of living and the ability to for art, because a lot of cr the art that is sort of timeless is enduring. A lot of that comes out of someone trying to express themselves uniquely and not trying to fit a market model or the flavor of the week or the month. And to have time to do that, if we're just slaving at a job, work, and in Toronto currently, like you have people who are working multiple jobs to make rent or afford a property. And yeah, that definitely has an impact, the cost of living. I, I to add to that. Yeah, Adam, go uh, ahead. Um, 
I think we also have to look at the motivations behind why a city is becoming a music city and what they're hoping to get out of it. So I think Toronto was kind of late to the game in terms of like around music city discourse anyway, especially for a city of its size and sort of, I guess, influence in the world with the amount of music that's coming, that has been coming out of Toronto. Um, so I think that having their music office and, and developing themselves sort of as a music city, they've they already sort of passed the point of like when it was even possibly possible to afford living here as a working musician. Um, so I think a lot of it is a branding exercise I, and I don't want to be always pessimistic about everything that we talk about here, but I do think that it is worth acknowledging that like when we think of music cities in Canada, Toronto often comes to top of mind. I think Montreal definitely rivals Toronto. I, I actually think it's a better city in terms Way of better. <laughs> cultural everything um, and supporting artists. It is definitely like more expensive now but it's still way more affordable for musicians. There's just a challenge there with the, like being say like an English musician in, in Montreal, there's often for some people, there's a ceiling that you might have to move out. Like if you're a hip hop artist, uh, an English hip hop artist in Montreal, you'll probably have to leave Montreal at some point. Um, Mon Toronto hasn't really done a lot to support musicians. It's really, to me, it feels like it's more focused on developing music industry and attracting touring acts to attract people to come there and see music more than it is trying to um, make life easier for people who are musicians. And there's also a conversation to be had about like also who gets to just like make money being a musician because it's so subjective. It's really challenging to tell one person that they're, you know, they're worthy of like, putting everything they have into becoming a musician because they make good music and another person who maybe isn't attractive to almost anyone is also sharing the same problems as you know a more established musician saying mm -hmm. like I deserve to make money off of this and so it should be affordable to me so there is a there is an interesting conversation that is probably bigger than what we're able to get into here hey, but totally. we do have cities around Canada too like like London Ontario is Canada's I think only UNESCO city of music um, I don't think Montreal can be the city of music because it, it's the city of design, I believe, from like the UNESCO designation. So, and I don't think a city can have more than one. Um, but it's London, Ontario, and it's actually a, a relatively affordable city to live in in comparison to most other cities, uh, even of its size. Uh, but they're doing a lot there. Um, it's not the most exciting city, but they're actually doing a lot to support music in that city from a number of different uh, avenues. And it completely goes overlooked. Um, so there are cities doing things. It's just where people, where the industry is and where you can make it. You can only go so far in some cities um, to be a musician. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head with Toronto focusing more on the economics or the fo attracting the larger touring acts versus building up a music um, ecosystem from the grassroots level. Because I feel like, you know, there's both top down, there's policy work and there's institutions and organizations and funders. But then there's a critical grassroots component that I feel gets neglected a lot in Toronto and the rising housing prices contributes, but also like we're losing our music venues here at an alarming rate, even though we're getting like the odd new one that opens like history, but we're lacking in any good music district. And I find like we have a lot of these issues like success you just mentioned that systems architects success to the successful where it's like especially with funders here like with canada council and the like they favor a, a certain pool of artists and those tend to be prioritized year on year versus space being made for new talent to come in not to say that there aren't a lot of canada does do a good job compared to a lot of countries around the world like supports for new artists like the factor grants um yeah. we've got a d decent funding ecosystem and infrastructure but one that still doesn't fully understand the systemic realities of what it means to be an artist here. And that's something that we've been working on, in fact, with the government, trying to bridge those gaps between what artists actually really need and what funders understand, it, what, whether it's the application itself or the reporting requirements. Hmm. Very interesting. Thank you both. Um, I see Sean Patrick has his hand up. So yeah, Sean. Yeah, kind of a follow-up on to David's, but I think it goes into two, two paths. Is... First, is there, has, has anyone made a distinction when you're talking about music cities as a branding exercise almost between institutional music cities and organic music cities? 
for example, that like I think Toronto when I arrived here in the mid '90s felt like an organic music city. Mm -hmm. I'll demonstrate by a anecdote. I used to play with a guy that had been a musician way back into the '80s, and he just recently moved back to Brantford because he couldn't afford to live here anymore. And he had been a working musician, never had a stable job, managed to pay rent, and eked out a living, but was very creative, and he can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, that is kind of the space we're in now where it's, we talk about Music City, but it felt a lot more at the time. Like there was other conditions there that we weren't naming that had that great ecosystem. So wondering on that distinction, and I kind of think of other cities like, say Quebec City is very institutional and Ottawa is very institutional, whether we're going that, down that path. And then the, the second one, which is where the role of geography may play if, if there is an organic de definition. Like you raised London, Ontario, and I grew up there before I moved to Toronto. It had a very good music scene at the time. Lots of musicians, as you said, it's they have a music hall of fame. Johnny Cash used to hang out there. It was just a totally different vibe. Mm -hmm. um, stuff people forget, but it that had a lot to do with geography. It was like between Detroit and Toronto. So every band that came through at the time before the internet played in this small provincial city. And it cr almost created like an ecosystem around it of interested musicians. So, and I also think of like Minneapolis in the States um, as well. It's like in the middle of nowhere, but you got like Prince and the replacement. So mm -hmm. yeah, two questions, like one on this institutional organic and then another on like geography, maybe for the smaller cities, but not branded, but seems to be something go going on there. Over. So geographically, there's definitely an impact on, and a big impact on how a music scene. And there's a link, there's some interlinkages there too. So. Geography can impact how well a city can function as a music city, both organically or artificially through um, design or accident even. And what happens is to, part of it comes back to how we define success and our success metrics as well, because you can still have a thriving music scene and never have a major international touring act come through. If if people, the community is engaged, you have a lot of outlets for people to be involved with music, to learn, to be able to showcase, play with each other, and also how we consider music. Because when it comes to the organic growth, I find that the cities where music grew organically, people recognized not only did conditions like housing and all facilitate, but also conditions of the heart and mind. Because music, you know, bringing it back to that systems level thinking, music is like, it's like, Anarchy. There's so much happening there, right? You've got biological feedback loops. Mu music is so much more than entertainment and a chart rating. Music has been historically used for community building, for therapy, cultural bridging. It can transform moods. There are so many studies out on the on and from the medical field about music's correlation on physiology and mental states. And I find that cultures that understand music's value tend to have more of a shot at becoming an organic music city. And Montreal is a great example. And like having lived in both Toronto and Montreal, I can say that the same band, seeing them on tour in Montreal versus Toronto is a wildly different experience. People in Montreal will happily be out on the patios on a Tuesday evening. They'll treat a cover band as if it was their favorite band at a place like Club Soda, you know? People will show up in droves, whereas Toronto, it could be an international touring act. And I remember there was a show at the Air Canada Center. It was called the Air Canada Center back then. And it was one of three shows where they had lost their liquor license for serving underage. And as punishment, three of their most lucrative shows of the season were fined and they weren't allowed to sell alcohol. So it was Nine Inch Nails, Queens of the Stone Age, and Death from Above 1979. High energy show. And seeing the, those bands in any other city, it's like you blow the roof off. Because Toronto wasn't selling liquor, the Air Canada Center felt like a tomb. And to the point that even the bands were like, what's going on? And we got an extra angry Nine Inch Nails performance that night. They're smashing guitars all over the place. It was great. Um, but coming back to your question, um, basically the geography has an impact because I think like when you're talking in modern music industry standpoints, proximity to routes is a big one because when touring schedules are decided, it's often based on efficiency and logistics. So gas prices, what route will be freed up, what venues are available. And if, you, if you're on a major through fare that, connect, that has a lot of venues and connects to a typical, say, East Coast or West Coast route, you're likelier to have bigger bands popping through. And if you're in a smaller rural town, 
that probably won't happen, but they require different policy approaches. So it's, it, this is why, you know, a, a one size approach to a music city can't work for like you can't have a federal one size fits all policy here. You'd have to have not not only provincial, but municipal ones as well, depending on their locations, because there's so many factors along the value chain from distribution to production. Uh, composition, creation, the whole shebang. Adam, do you want to touch on any of the two questions? Yeah, I have a couple things to add. I think, first of all, like one thing that we, I think, should do is just open up our idea of like what the music city is and, and how there is no formal designation of what a music city is. There's no formal definition. Um, the one I like the best that I've ever heard from someone is that uh, it was Shane Shapiro, who is the person who started Sound Diplomacy, which is a music city consultancy. Uh, in a conversation, and this isn't even their definition, but uh, he just said this in a podcast that really stuck out to me, and it's like what I like to follow is a music city is any city that takes music seriously, and I really like that really high level approach to it because you can look at it from any direction, and you can also reflect on it. So are we taking music seriously when we do this? Um, and so they cities around the world that are and it. So still largely it is a very Western notion. I think a lot of uh, music city discourse is in talking about uh, the sort of Western industry type thing. So we're looking at London, we're looking at New York, we're looking at Nashville, Austin, um, even though there are many, many, many cities around the world where music exists very differently and is valued differently and shared differently. Um, and you can go and probably experience music in so many different ways um so that's just something to consider but right now there's a lot of places that are sort of taking up the definition and thinking about it as like oh well we're we're the music city because we have i forget like melbourne has like some wild number of venues um probably i i forget how many but it's like it's there's a lot of music venues in melbourne so they are a music city um, London, Ontario, like I said, is a music studio because it has the UNESCO designation and they do a lot. Um, so people are sort of taking stock of what they have and then determining their sort of own music city status based on what they believe they have. And I think that's actually a good thing because, um, so I'm from, I guess I'm from a bunch of places, but <laughs> most recently I'm from Alamont, Ontario, which is very close to Ottawa. And uh, I'm part of the board for uh, what's called Focus Almont, and it's a, just a folk music concert series that is, goes through the winter just to give people something to do. And we get some pretty decent acts for a, a small town. Um, but as I joined that, I learned about all of the music offerings in a town of 5,000 people. We're actually competing for space quite regularly, so we have to book our venue which is the old town hall well in advance because there's a lot of music off musical offerings in almont um from classical to just songwriting circles to people just putting on concerts to having multiple different festivals um and they use it in different ways they even have a festival in the summertime called like five wednesdays in july or something um where it is very much a, a community development operation where music is the focal point and it's free it's in a park uh in in town and there are local musicians that come and play but they also get local organizations come out to share their what, what they offer the community um in a variety of different ways there was like this composting group that came out so it's really connecting people in the community and it's building those connections so that's my definitely my interest of uh, the social infrastructure aspect of it. People get to know each other and people start to look out for each other. And to me, that's a great measure of sort of a music city or a music place, considering Almont is not uh, a city at all. The geography aspect, I think that does answer some of it because we can look at geography in so many different ways. It's such a, you can't really, you can do the geography of every, anything in every topic. But um, yeah, I think proximity to, I'm not, I'm, I probably won't, reiterate all the things that said of proximity to the uh, roots and different uh, larger cities is important. Um, but also it's the way that the cities choose to use music as well. And so they might have totally homegrown talent that might not be popular anywhere. Maybe they're just a group of people in town that play music together that can sell out uh, a local venue or they just are brought in to enhance different experiences around the community. And I think 
that use of geography and that lens of geography is just as important to look at when we're considering what uh, music cities are. All right, you got some Almont love in the chat, Adam, so you can be proud of that. Um, wonderful uh, discussion so far, and I think this is such a wide ranging topic. Um, one of the things that maybe for this section, it's just to chat about, or I wanna prompt both of you, Adam and Zayan, is we talked about a lot about some of the dependencies and Zayan, you mentioned the value chain. So for example, a dependency might be the cost of living um, or the availability space. I want, you know, maybe both of you can stretch um, our imagination about what are some of those wide sweeping changes that are ongoing in the world today um, that are affecting music cities? Like, can you almost draw the causality of it? I know we chatted uh, earlier about te technological changes, perhaps uh, even post COVID or during COVID, you might be able to refer to some of that. And, you know, maybe just really illustrating some of the dependencies about uh, the changes that are ongoing and how music cities adapt successfully or unsuccessfully to that. Just to get you rolling, Zian, I know you mentioned like the spot Spotify or, or the, the shift from music uh, in its format and its technology, you know, to what extent does that have an effect on people's relationship to music as an example? Or were there other changes in COVID that also came up? Oh, Zayan, you're on, you're on mute, that's why. So many changes, especially over COVID, because I think COVID really took out a lot of the conventional models of distribution, like artists couldn't tour anymore. And that impacted record writing and release because typically now since the advent of streaming and um, going back all the way to Napster and stuff, artists' revenue streams primarily derive now from live uh, touring and live merchandise sales as opposed to the sales of recorded albums. So not only were artists not touring, you wind up seeing this situation where they don't have the incentive to release an album because they couldn't tour behind it. So it wound up representing a waste of money and time. So a lot of artists pivoted um, broadcast models to live streams, doing things online. And in fact, I saw a lot more creativity coming out of artists and how they chose to engage with their audiences than we have in a long time through conventional um, channels. Because as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of gatekeeping with the conventional uh, mainstream music industry and a lot of requirements for how something gets on the radio, how long it stays there. And there's a lot of engineering as well behind the scenes, uh, prices paid out. And we've seen this interesting shift as well, where you have a lot more independent artists coming up who aren't um, beholden to a record label to do their promotion and distribution. And a lot of the online distribution channels have made that more feasible to actually make a decent living if they're and tour and do all the things. But again, there's that de design or systemic tension there of oversaturation of the market because it does become easier for people to come in. And I mentioned earlier that Spotify has something in the tunes of, in the tune of, haha, no pun intended, literally to have like 100,000 songs a day being released there. Mm. There's a lot of trends around production, recording as well, and the way sounds are produced, to the aesthetic, um, to the technology that goes into it. So now, because we can record, I mean, you can fit what required an entire recording studio in multiple rooms before in our backpack, literally, and produce recordings that are superior sonically to pro recordings sometimes. And that's been an interesting shift. So, in fact, I just finished a paper with Canada Arts Council and a group called Pathways looking at the future of digital tools for Canadian musicians as it relates to composition, recording, and performance. And I can drop a link to the whole project here and the horizon scan. So because there's you can take the trends that places have to evolve with and look out for across, like, you know, the framework, the steep V plus plus looking at social trends, technological trends, economic ones, policy shifts, things relating to privacy, IP laws, um, values, like what people think is acceptable or not, not just tastes and preferences, but what people think is acceptable. So in that sense, you've got so many intersecting systems and because of the way music functions too, like it triggers our memories, our moods in a way that few other things can. So you have these interesting situations where music is intricately connected to political protests, to con connect it to big social changes. You might have defining songs, songs might influence it. So music is like really, intricately woven in and I actually forgot what your initial question was I got 100% got derailed 
No, that's all right. It, it was a, you definitely helped deliver that expansive view of all the dependencies. And maybe, maybe I'll put it to Adam and, and put you on the spot. Like, Adam, do you see if you, if we kind of do like a McLuhan tetrad thing, I, I forget the exact actual terms, but what affordances when cities take advantage of these shifts that are happening, what affordances have you seen them create positively? And what are some of the risks that we actually lose when they take advantage of some shifts? I know you mentioned even speculatively about the loss of potentially folk music as an example. Um, can you hear me okay now? Yeah. Is this better than before? It's the quality is better, a little low, but quality is great. Okay, I'll try to speak louder. Okay. Um, yeah, I, well, I think there's a few things. I think, first of all, it isn't necessarily what cities are doing so much as what people in the cities are doing and how cities are responding. Um, so if we look at COVID, I think that some of the, some of the new things are actually old things um, because we saw a lot more people, you know, in around the world in different countries. I know like one of the big ones is Italy where people all of a sudden started playing music on their balconies and playing music together. And so we saw the value in connecting in that way and using music as a way to actually reach out to one another. And uh, we know that music is a form of physical touch and a time where people couldn't connect one another with one another in close proximity. We reached out to music to help connect each other again. And I thought that that seemed like a novel and new and innovative way to use the way that we used to use music um, in our in like our previous conversation, I, I think about folk music and if folk music can continue to, or if it is not can, sorry, if it is continuing to exist. And I don't mean folk, the, the popular genre, I mean folk as in music that is developed in community and, and are, is often used as a way to share stories um, and experiences and passing that on from person to person, not necessarily recording it, but memorizing it and sharing it that way. Just because music is seen as such a commercial venture now, even when you're just playing with friends, um, you're often playing cover songs or writing songs that maybe you're not sharing in the same way as you would with folk music. But the other thing that we started to see with like COVID, for example, is reimagining what a venue looks like. Um, and so we have a lot of conversations about uh, venues closing down and that is a devastating, I, I, and I, I don't use that word lightly. I didn't think it is devastating that all these musics are, music spaces are closing down. Um, and we think about what that ultimately does to community and the communities that are formed there but it also gave an opportunity to reflect on where music can exist and how it can exist. And then you have places like Side Door Access or, or groups like Side Door who are creating musical moments and concerts uh, and musical experiences in untraditional spaces, um, but also you're looking at multi-purpose spaces like community centers or libraries, um, places that already exist that need more um, exposure or want to give people more exposure to them um, as ways to at least facilitate music and thinking about what that does. Um, and also that they're multi-use spaces that don't rely on just one single revenue source of music or a club night or a bar. Um, so I think that those were, I guess, reimagined and like I said, using old things. Um, I also kind of forget the question a little bit, <laughs> but oh, well, one thing that I, I, I feel like this connected in my brain, this connected and hopefully it makes the connection, but please let me know if I'm off base. Um, one thing that I think also cities do or, or should do, I don't know, uh, is really need to let things also happen a little bit organically. So in a conversation we had previously, I was at a Music City Summit in 2019 in Toronto as part of uh, Canada Music Week, and there were some people talking about uh, Edmonton and how the, there's a really thriving, there's a variety of thriving music scenes in Edmonton, um, and people wanted to, people from the city were like, what do we do, like, what do we do to capitalize on this and to support, and two people that I, I had met there that were, I was chatting with were both like, the best thing to do is just leave it alone, like, allow people the 
the latitude to like experiment and build community and that spreads now that we have the internet people hear about different cities and things that are happening there and they want to go there and to experience them themselves and people are making those connections across music and that's been happening for a very long time but especially since message board culture has uh been built um people are wanting to go and play music with other people and so there is a level i think that you need to still support music and support musicians and so we can't just leave it alone entirely but there is a level of that sort of leave it alone let it happen grassroots uh that i think also needs to happen and that's a, a, an avenue cities really need to think hard about uh as much as they want to sink their teeth into it and and help build their their city brand I don't know if that answers your question. I completely agree with you too. You know, there is something critical about leaving things well alone, allowing that space for emergence, for things to spawn organically and having that balance with being able to create the conditions necessary for like music to thrive. But Zad, coming back to your question, did you mention McLuhan's Tetrad? I did, yeah. Okay, that's hilarious. Okay, actually, actually, let's go with that because there are not too many avenues that we can chat about that with without. But yeah. for those who aren't familiar, it's it's like a framework that explores um, the impact of technology on the medium. It looks at, um, I believe, four dimensions because it's a tetrad: mm -hmm. enhancement, obsolescence, retrievement, and reversal. And with that in mind, I think one of the big ones, the biggest drivers that has got the music industry kind of quaking right now, is artificial intelligence and the role that's going to have. And it, the media industry in general, like right now, there's a big $800 million project paused in Hollywood for expansion because once Sora came out, like basically looking at how what AI could do for video production has blown people's mind. And that's similarly coming into the space of music as well from it, not only the standpoint of composition, but critically like from for mixing, mastering, engineering, for figuring out distribution channels, campaigns. So you were talking about the value chain, right? So AI will have pretty rippling impacts across the entire value chain from how artists are envisioning their brand and identity, how they're communicating with people. And you you run the risk where you have an AI artist chatbot talking to an audience chatbot, and that's the engagement that's happening. So it's a very interesting new world is going to come that has both positive and negatives around that. So, so yeah, let, let's let's bring in the audience here and maybe use that prompt as as a way. Like, does anyone have reflections on their changing relationship to music or music cities? Given that we're talking about the changes that we're all experiencing, and or questions for Zayan and Adam, how have your relationships to music changed in the last little while? I think Don, you're yeah, yeah. Don, go ahead. I'm not going to be able to say this too too much personally because I'm seeing looking at it from a much broader uh, point of view because I've been around a long time <laughs> and I've watched uh, all kinds of trends happen in music. I, I I think there's always a kind of struggle between is music a consumable or is it a connector? Now it can be both at once, but it's it tends to lean one way or the other, right? Depending on the zeitgeist and the time available and the people in the room, right? And I've seen it move back and forth quite a bit. Uh, I think the disappearance of those local venues is a is really a big significant signifier of where we're going now. Um <laughs> when you mentioned it, what AI will do, I remember a story I heard a while ago about a because this has been in the in this been technology that could change music and the sounds significantly for a long time. But there's a story about an opera singer who was recording uh, an album, and uh, they were listening to the playback of, after the uh, the sound engineers and got at it. And apparently, her uh, her conductor turned to her and said, "Don't you wish you could sing like that?" <laughs> and that maybe encapsulates what you can lose, right? In one, and also what in another sense, what you can gain, but at what cost, right? That's the thing. Uh, Almont was a little town near Ottawa. I know Almont, I've driven through it many times. <laughs> but, and I've seen, and it had a lively art scene. 
And by the way, I've seen this in all of, of the arts, you know, uh, I was been connected with the literary scene for a while, the local literary scene as well. And I've noticed that now almost anybody who wants to get a reading, unless it's an open mic, has to have a BFA at least, you know, preferably an MFA, you know, Master of Fine Arts, because otherwise, how can you really be a writer? How can you really be a poet, you know? Uh, well, guess what? <laughs> they used to come right out of the woodwork, right off the streets, right? And that's not that long ago. So it's a confusing time because there are counter currents as well as currents moving in both directions. And there's always a drive to move one way or the other. That's my observation. Mm -hmm. Say so on any, it sounds like you have any thoughts on music as consumable or connector or any of the themes Don was sharing? Oh, for sure. For sure. Like, you know, like Don said, I feel like it's both. And then some, like I see music the way I see food in so many ways that mm. consumes you, it nourishes you. The absence of music can actually depress you. And it does function as a connector the same way, like you can enjoy a meal in solitude and get the same benefits from it as you would technically nutritionally eating it with other people. But there's a whole different value we place on dining in community, which is evidenced by you know our restaurant scenes and yeah. people really like that. And music, again, it can be enjoyed in solitude, but then there's something powerful about not only watching someone play it, but also composing and writing together. And, you know, I, I really love what you said about the MFAs and, and, and the degrees, because you don't need any of that to be a good musician. You don't need a, a historical knowledge. It's, it's from the soul, it's from the heart, just like you don't need to necessarily be, go to culinary school to be a great chef. And a lot of folks tell me that, oh, I can't improvise, I can't jam. But then when it's reframed that, can you have a conversation? How often are you thinking, but they're like, but I don't know music theory. But I'm like, how often do we think about how we're constructing a verb or an adverb when we're speaking? We're flowing. And I feel like music is so much more than that. It's a connector. It's a form of expression. It's, we've made it a consumable and it can be consumed, but um, there's, there's a lot to it. <laughs> I, I think, just to add to that too, and going back to a conversation we previously had is that this is one of those times where we recognize too that like music is not inherently good. Um, it is what we place on it. So just like any kind of art, it's not necessarily good or bad, um, but it is, I mean, I think that there is some music that is bad and not because it's, it's poorly played or it doesn't sound good, but I think that like the community that forms around it and the messages and the politics associated with it are bad. And that's what I think is bad music. But um, that I think when we look at, you know, the value of music, it's it's not inherently good. It's because we use it to like Zayan said, like nourish ourselves and share and connect um, and that value that we put on it. So I think when we look at AI with music, I mean, maybe I'm leapfrogging what's going to happen, but I do think that the that aspect of music will, sort of eclipse the the fast easy like oh let's just make a quick buck to seeing people who are actually sharing their their themselves and their experiences and then we're connecting on a human level with another human who we can relate to and not the sort of the computer generated lyrics and song like i used the grammarly generative ai function and just told it to write a song about almont one day just to see what it did and it wasn't that bad in terms of like a, a little like short little folk song about a town. And I was like, this is concerning, but also it's totally soulless. That's hilarious, Adam. Um, yeah, any anyone else from, from the audience that hasn't spoken or any other questions for Adam and Zayan as we continue the conversation, especially around shifts in music and the music relationship? Elena has her hand up. Here I can, oh, oh sorry, Elena, you, there it is. I want to bring up something I saw in the New York Times today about uh, holding companies and private equity buying up back catalogs and re-releasing them in slightly new formats. And the concern that this would shut out 
um, new talent and and you know kind of more more commodify what's there rather than having it remain as a an engaging entertainment and and way of communicating. So totally, and one of the companies that's doing a lot of that is Hypnosis under Merc Mercuriatus, and. It's interesting because a lot of legacy artists are going down that route of having their entire catalogs be up for sale. And you're right. I feel like it does shift to a future where music becomes further and further commodified. Um, fewer people hold, hold up the rights to the share and access that music. And it concentrates profit making potential and the power of a small number of people and also gives them the leeway over how that music gets distributed, the quality you get to access it and the terms and conditions as well, whether you get to access it in the highest quality or you have to pay more to get it above a certain quality it's an interesting time with that and i feel like the jury's out because i feel there are there can be positive effects of that but for me right now it's a push too far towards commodification sean yeah sean yeah i'm not sure where this would go i'd be interested in looking at um make a parallel to like the hockey leagues is they kind of depend on like so many young hockey players going into the league to get to the superstars. I'm interested in how many people, kids nowadays are learning music like I did back in the day. Uh, like if you look what's going on with guitars, all the companies have consolidated. Yeah, a lot just, of they have a lot less instruments. Like kids aren't learning in the same way. So that's my take from afar. So I wonder before we get to the city level, just like that has something changed at the bottom level? Because learning is also like, uh, uncomfortable and the thing that ai does it takes away the discomfort of like trying mm -hmm. to learn and experiment with things maybe i'm wrong i'm an old guy but i'm interested in that where that would where that took place like i sat in a basement when i was growing up every summer and just like noodled away i don't know how much of that goes on or to the same extent that would then feed the ecosystem so just an open-ended question it's a, a really good question as well and it's it's interesting i think um because I can, from firsthand experience during the pandemic, um, guitar sales went up tremendously. So the company I'm endorsed by, Strandberg, we are we couldn't keep up with demand. Uh, Fender also reported record sales, and they reported that during the pandemic, more people were buying guitars than ever before. And it's interesting because after the pandemic, there was a bit of a slump in sales, and we see a lot of, like, I there's a, co a convention that happens in Anaheim every year. It's called NAM, and it's the um, world's largest music industry conference and basically most of the major gear manufacturers from around the world will launch their products at this conference and you get to see based on the types of the booth and the quality which genres are doing better than the others and there's definitely been a big shift towards electronic music and the dj type stuff where you know the the budgets are going there and they're being favored even from us looking at it systemically it's not just about the style of music and the aesthetic appeal, but it's appealing to venue venues and promoters because it's far cheaper to host a, a DJ and a backline for that than it is to host a full band, let alone something with an or a horn section and all. And then you have, from the audience standpoint, there's also more consistency and reliability with sonic quality night after night, whereas with traditional instruments, you know, tube amps, they, they sometimes don't sound the same two nights in a row, depending on the humidity in the room, how full the room is and the like. So there are definitely shifts in that realm, but I feel there's still that commitment to your, to learning, to developing craft on an instrument that doesn't go away. Like, there's still, like sales for guitar pedals and all backed up. It's in fact, we're going through a golden era right now, I'd say in guitar pedals and sonic experimentation, where you have so many boutique companies coming out and we're getting sounds that we haven't heard before. Like even 20 years ago, you had like, you were limited to the big few, like you had your Roland Boss, you had TC Electronic, you had a few larger companies and it wasn't feasible for smaller companies to get in the game. But because there've been so many shifts across the value chain with distribution, with access to manufacturers, manufacturing space, you have a lot more entrance into the market as well. So I'd say it's not uniformly distributed. There's a lot of vibrancy in some places. And like you say, like learning is tough and people will historically like to choose the easy path sometimes if it's available. But I see AI augmenting people's ability to learn faster, compose faster, mix and master faster than necessarily replace 
the talent outright because the, there's something about the heart and the connection. However, from the corporate interest side, there's definitely a big push to drive out the number of salaries that are paid across the value chain, how many artists you're hiring to do the album work and the setback tour backdrops, um, the visual artists you're hiring. So it's it's an interesting time. I hope that was able to answer some some of it. Okay, good. Let's um, shift a little bit. Um, so we're, get, we're getting into now, and I'm thinking what systems are supporting and enabling and uh, music cities and what are missing, um, what's your experience? We, we talked a little about education systems uh, and how they might interact. Um, do you think of other systems that might relate and, and help along a music city? Adam, because I've rambled on so much. Of well, that's, a good, that's, a, that's a really good question. I think that we can definitely see a lot of places where different things connect. Um, Education is an interesting one because it happens and it comes up in the Music City discourse in a, in a few ways. So it's instruments in schools, it's music programming in schools, whether it's like a music class formally or after school programming. But it also comes up uh, in a way that is very interesting to me. Um, where we look at music as um, almost like a savior or music as a way to, yeah, I guess, save people. Um, and there is some really interesting conversation around it where, you know, we, we need to put music programming in these specific neighborhoods because for whatever reason, and I think it does a few things. I think it makes music, the role of music sometimes bigger than it needs to be. Um, but it also definitely is looking at music uh, in a way that it is, um, I mean, so we're doing, there. a lot of music programming is put in place to uh, keep kids out of gangs and keep kids from selling drugs. And I think that we can probably all understand who people are speaking about when they talk about developing music programming for something like that. And so there are some very uh, challenging implications around that because that type of programming is not used for different types of crime. For example, we don't talk about adding music education programming into communities to help stop insurance fraud or white collar crimes or time theft <laughs> or not time theft, the other, wage theft. Um, so I, I, I do think that there, there is some interesting interactions between different systems in the way that, whether they're social or cultural, um, in the way that we talk about music education and the role of music in that regard. Um, but I also think that there are other city systems too, like transportation, for example, is a great example of where music is being used to, uh, enhance the experience of people commuting. Um, and it also, again, I, 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 I'm, I always slant towards the connection aspect of music, so I apologize that it always comes up in all of my answers. But there are places like, I think it was in Sweden, maybe Stockholm, where they created a um, the stairs to one of the subway stations or the train stations was turned into like a giant piano, basically. And people were walking up and down the stairs, but then they realized that every time they took a step, it made a different sound. And you have people basically sort of playing the stairs like a piano and other people standing around watching and people are talking. And so it en encourages people to take the stairs. It encourages social connection. It encourages sharing and creativity. And it just interrupts the mundane, like everyday commute to work. Um, and that's just one intervention that does all those things. Um, so yeah, I, th I think we can see it um, in, in different types of systems in the city um, in a variety of different ways and, and a lot of different interventions. Uh, totally. And you know, even flipping the transport example, there's music in transportation and then there's a lot of policy shifts around how transportation works for musicians, like even with airline requirements about carrying on equipment. And like, but when it comes to Industries that are affected with education, I feel like there's not only the conventional role of music education that's teaching about music, that's teaching the theory, the history and the sociology and all, but I feel there needs to be a shift in music education that focuses more on the biological aspects of music, 
and looking at it more holistically as well, like the, um, looking at biological aspects, community benefits, and even the harms that Adam brought up earlier, because music can be used to manipulate or used for subversion as well. And with education, I feel we also have to, there are shifts taking place now slowly. And, but to start looking at music from more pluralistic worldviews, so start to look at international perspective, but it's about even theory, because currently in Western music theory, like a lot of the subdivisions, it's like your 12 notes. But then if you look at Greek, Greek theory, Indian theory, then that gets subdivided further. And because ultimately if we're looking at it from a science perspective, it's how we're subdividing the sound waves. And you realize that a lot of the way we approach notes and pitches aren't necessarily a result of how we engage with music, but the limitations of the physical instruments of the time and what notes they were able to reliably reproduce, or even the fact that those interlinks of technology are so strong that, you know, like with pop music, a lot of folks think the standard is about three and a half minutes. And that's not because of any inherent quality of the song or music, but it's because at one point that was the maximum that you could record because of the technology, but that became a so social convention. So I feel like these things are interesting. The social, technological, cultural, they they reinforce or impact each other in different ways. Just to add something to that as well, um, and kind of going back to the, also bringing in the topic of like new music sort of technology, um, there are there are definitely groups um, that are doing really important and great music community development work who are bringing in sort of at-risk youth to, um, I mean, and I use that, term for lack of any better term that is coming to my mind right now um who like to to teach them about things like production and um meeting them where they're at so they're not bringing in specific like oh here's a bunch of guitars or here's uh you know some trumpets and like whatever we can scrounge together all of that is great programming but there is also a lot of great programming in the education space that is really bringing what certain demographics uh, uh, like age demographics are more interested in and, and making it more accessible to them so that they might want to con continue and see a future in it beyond just an after school program as well, um, which I think is pretty cool. Since we have uh, at least one person who is talking about their age, <laughs> how is how is the um, the shift demographic shift impacting uh, music and music cities in in many interesting ways I, I think and it's not distributed evenly internationally it depends on a lot of value systems around how societies treat um people at different st uh, stages of their life cycle like in a lot of asian cities like in japan for example they revere people as they grow older and their interaction and engagement with music tends to be very different from North America, where, um, truth be told, the society here can be a bit ageist. And after a certain point, they stop marketing concerts and promoting musical activities to certain types of them, to certain people. And I feel like with shifting demographics, we have a lot of changes nowadays in the last few years about genres, the walls between genres being broken down significantly. We have a lot of intermingling of international influences, stylistic influences, aesthetic influences. And we're starting to see a lot of shifts slowly to venues that are starting to think more about inclusive design and accessibility as a priority, um, to start to think about even how music is recorded and mixed and mastered to cater to different types of hearing or how music is described. So there've been a lot of advances in the accessibility front lately, but I think there's still a long way to go in what demographic shifts uh, in particular do you have any particular in mind because uh, there are many uh, depending on which age group we're talking about uh well so we had a, a, worldwide we have aging populations right and so um i it, but i but in north america i agree with you we have a youth culture and so i have to admit that i'm not as engaged with music as i used to be Absolutely. And and a lot of that is our environment and our structure, right? Because as we age, even the ways we in which we enjoy music tend to shift because um, I, I recently was able to host an event where 
it was to get people to focus on music where it wasn't a soundtrack to your commute or your gym workout where you could actually focus on the music. And one of the biggest feedbacks I got after piece of feedback were that people hadn't been able to experience music like that in years for some folks, decades. And I feel like our culture relegates music oftentimes to something background, something that plays in an elevator, the background of your supermarket. And I feel like, again, it comes back to how we value music in our societies and how we frame that value. And that will impact how our societies interact with and engage with music. Adam, would you like to take a human geography view of this? <laughs> um, well, I, I don't think I have much new to add so much, but I do know that there's also a lot of like music being used to help support people who, you know, thinking of an aging population, you know, have dementia, for example, uh, and building in spaces where people can go somewhere and hear something and it supports them in, in that way. Um, so there's a lot of like, I think it goes back to the biological aspect of it, but it definitely brings in the um, just compassionate aspect of music as well. And, and using it as like reminding ourselves like why it's important and who can benefit from it. It definitely is in some ways, I don't know if medicinal is the right word, but definitely can help people cope with a variety of different different things and I think when we're looking at an aging population um you know when my grand my no no got dementia he was Italian and he went back to only speaking Italian he couldn't speak English anymore um and so thinking and hearing uh Italian music was important to him and it was important to our family to like see that um so I guess, yeah, there's a lot, I think there's a lot more going in that aspect, but I think that there are also interventions in sp in different public spaces. So I guess, yeah, taking the human geography approach, um, public pianos, I think is a good intervention mm. into that to bring people together. Um, I think when people learn piano, they learn a lot of different type of music, especially if you're taking formal lessons where there are songs uh, that across many, many generations uh, and people like and enjoy playing them. And so when they have the opportunity to play that in public, they share that with one another. Um, and so it can connect people in a lot of different ways. I think this is where you see the value of busking um, come into play where people will play cover songs um, from all different you know, decades, but also it allows people to play different types of instruments and different types of music. Um, more traditional instruments, for example. Um, so not only are you connecting people at different age cohorts, but you're also connecting people from different cultural backgrounds into a space. Some people might see that and be reminded of home or growing up, and other people might see it and be connected to it because it's interesting and it's new and it's a pleasant sound and they're interested. In it. And so um, there's also, there was in Montreal, Montreal is always doing the best things, um they had this uh i forget what group it was based out of a lab in at mcgill but they had something called music kiosk um and what that was was this group they just put a bluetooth speaker in um a gazebo in like a small park i think in little portugal somewhere and they just let people show up with their device that they could plug into it or connect to it and people were playing lots of different types of music and there was a lot of concern about what would happen there uh, by allowing this to happen but what they found that people were very respectful about it and they noticed a lot of people connecting with one another because they were playing songs that they hadn't heard in a long time and people going there putting their plugging in their phone or whatever playing some songs other people hearing it coming over to also hear it and so it did allow people to connect in a public space. And again, that's my sort of like free music bent on this is um, it costs almost nothing to put a public speaker there. And they had some rules around it, like time and, and volume um, restrictions, but otherwise it brought more people to the park, park where there were a lot more elderly people that would go and sit, um, a lot of elderly Portuguese people, if I remember, um, using it as a space to connect and talk. And then there was more younger people there or people of different ages showing up um, and really becoming more of a, a mixed space where people from across 
different cultures and ages and everything were connecting over over music. It's very something very simple. For sure. Yeah. There, there was something really powerful there about the dementia care example because music is there are so many leaps and bounds in mental health research, especially using music and dementia. It made me think of one thing as you were talking about different age groups and cohorts connecting, because one of the commonalities with a lot of the dementia research is that they play music for people that they used to love when they were younger. And that tends to have a elicit a positive response or trigger some memories. And what I wonder, as we think of future cities, why is it that most people tend to form stronger emotional connections with music in their youth? Is it it's anything to do with the inherent quality of the music itself? Is it because of the amount of time we have available to interact with the music? Is it because our social connections are stronger? But it's a question I'm posing back to the room. How do you think your re relation to music and how a song hits you changed as you move through life? Do certain things still give you goosebumps? Do new things still give goosebumps? How, how do you feel it? Mm. David, this one's for you. Oh, well, <laughs> I'd be the exception. I, I, whenever I get in like a limousine or something like that, and they're playing music, I always ask, can you play something from this century? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, I know. I know. I'm. I'm. I almost Zan. It's a funny question because I'm reflecting on my own relationship to music, which I've, <clears throat> I'm going to be very transparent. I've actually had a decline in my relationship to music and my intimacy with it. So, I find I find myself arriving in the same pattern behaviors that I observe other people as they get older, which is it's harder to take on new music with the same enthusiasm that I did 10, 20 years ago. But the but the the music that, that I did love at that period is still still hits me in the feels as they say, um, and and I and I almost am a betraying my younger self because I was like I'll never become that I'm exactly that and I can't explain it. I I have a possible explanation. It's because when you were had the time to listen to music as has been mentioned, but it was everywhere. It was ambient. It was all over the place. And it was being played again and again. And the pieces were there. And sometimes you saw the acts, right? Or you knew the people. I actually knew a bunch of people who became fairly famous uh, when I was in my early 20s. I don't mean anybody like that anymore. But <laughs> that's a long time ago. But I think that can be overcome uh, to some degree, if you want to, by making a habit of trying to learn new forms of music. You know, you don't want to go down that long lonely path to uh, to total isolation, which can be dementia or it can be just plain loneliness, um, which is probably more common. But it, it is difficult. And besides which, music hits the zeitgeist of the time, you know? And if that's not the time you grew up, eh, if it's something, I mean, like, <laughs> when I was teaching, I used to say that to, to the kids, you know, don't play any rap for me, a rap is crap. <laughs> now I didn't entirely believe it, but I really didn't want to hear it. <laughs> and that's I, I on the other, I on the other hand, am a Toronto jazz festival fan. I actually go through the hey. schedule and I play everything on YouTube. If I don't know the artist, go <laughs> like, I wonder why I hear this. No, I don't want to hear this. But then there's other ones. It's like, oh, I haven't heard this guy. It's like I need to go over there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. fair. That's a good move. Yeah. Zayon, does that give you anything to uh, as a response? No, absolutely. Some great responses. And I find like, you know, I, I mentioned I've been in music for 20 years and I've had ebbs and flows myself. Like, I love music. It's my life. I've given so many examples. But there'll be times where I'm just fed up of even my favorite song. And I find sometimes I'll be burnt out and I don't want to listen to something new. But then I find myself, something will inspire me and catch me. Be like, whoa, what is that? And I'll go down this rabbit hole and um, like lately, my latest one is this fellow called Lewis Cole, who's this outrageous multi-instrumentalist. He plays everything. And him and Jacob Collier, too. Like Jacob Collier's working with like Herbie Hancock, Quincy Jones and all. But what's mm -hmm. what I found is funny is that whenever I've taken a break from music and I come back to my instrument, if I if it happens to be a break from my instrument and I come back, I'll find a, a technique or something that's been eluding me sometimes will become clearer. And I've also found to my consternation that there's no end to learning. I've been playing for 20 years, I've been taking lessons um, throughout, and there's still so much to learn 
not only in terms of theory and knowledge, how to interact, but also from a physicality standpoint, how the music touches me, how I'm able to emote with my instrument, but also the levels of fine motor function that 20 years later, I'm still able to find new nuances in playing. And to me, that blows my mind. Like I, I literally have my baits here <laughs> next to me right now. It's like any excuse to play it. It's, it's just a beautiful music. It's just a beautiful thing to me. It's That's awesome. So um, I'm just jumping back into the convo and I'm not sure if I missed a specific thread, but one thing I wanted to pick up on is um, Adam was referencing the the street piano, the free free piano, play me pianos. And we, we've been chatting a lot about Montreal has come up, Quebec has come up. And maybe I wanted to expand that geography of Canada and look at the full range of it. It is really interesting. I'm a big fan of Secret City Records and Patrick Watson in the in the Montreal scene. So like he's always doing the free pianos um, aspect, and you could just see in the videos like so many people uh, huddle around that. And I think it's just a wonderful community uh, building thing. So that so that Adam, your bias is on point. I just wonder like can, can we observe the differences across the provinces about how people relate to the communal aspect about music, the East Coast in particular has a particular historical uh, connotation about what folk music means for the East Coast. Like you and your dad, your parents' generation and your grandparents are all in the same house playing playing, playing jams together after dinner. That's like the common thing. Um, and the diversity of how that relates, you know, out, out West as well. And I don't know, I guess the question I'm trying to discover, my question, is there a relationship between the type of music city interventions that are offered and the geography, which we talked about a little bit, but in Canada? And why why do we think those dynamics exist in the ways that they do? One that immediately springs to mind is how Montreal deals with music in the winter versus how Toronto does. Montreal mm. gets much colder than Toronto. I, in fact, moved back from Montreal because of one particular cold winter morning where I had to scrape ice off my glasses. But Montreal will still host outdoor music festivals like Igloo Fest in the depth of winter, and it will be sold out. People will show up. And I feel like the geography can impact a place beyond like things like infrastructure on mobility, transit, and built infrastructure. But that value system of how much do people enjoy it? Like we mentioned earlier that music fans in Montreal tend to be more lively and connect with the music at a deeper level. Adam mentioned how seriously a city takes music. And I feel like those are some of the factors that influence more than like abject geography. Adam, anything on that? I, I, I think that some of the things we need to think about is um, like how culture and community are formed in different locations across the country as well. I think winter is a huge impact on, um, or just like cold weather, cold damp weather, for example, like in Newfoundland uh, might be, a re I haven't done any research in this, so I'm just speculating, but might be a reason why people play music together inside so frequently. Um, it's hard to be outside. It's, it's We live in a very harsh climate. Um, and I think that different the ways that different cities and sites uh, in uh, like recognizing that this is like a, a colonial country um, or the way that different or colonized country um, the the way that different cities and who came there uh, first really probably laid some foundation to the way that different sounds came to those places and the music that uh, developed there. Um, and we can see like the way that, uh, and I'm not an expert, nor am I going to claim to know at, at just about anything on this, but I think that the way that Indigenous music is used also is different um, across the country in different places and, and traditionally how it's um, like what, it, what's, what it's about and what it's used for um, is also different. Um, so, but our, our cities that are more, you know, diverse and multicultural are going to hear a lot of influence um, of that throughout the, especially early on. Uh, and as that changes, I think that the sounds will definitely fluctuate as well. I think you hear a lot of that in hip hop. I think hip hop um, adopts a lot of different sounds like that very easily and quickly um, in really interesting ways. Um, and even electronic music, I think really brings that in.
Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's some, and, and there's influence from the U.S. Like I think Vancouver's punk scene is incredible, um, and it definitely is he heavily influenced from that, like L.A., Portland, Seattle, Bellingham, Vancouver corridor. Um, I think that it's like one of the most slept on scenes in Canada, weirdly, even though it's like the third largest city. Uh, New Brunswick also has an amazing punk scene. And one interesting thing that I think that has to do with that is um, there's a lot of youth who ride the trains across the country and they try to get to Vancouver because it's warmer and they stop in different cities as well. So this is definitely influencing at least uh, punk music in a lot of areas might might not be huge, but I've definitely in Ottawa met when I was younger, uh, met a number of people who came from New Brunswick uh, and they have the French and English influence um, and they're trying to get to Vancouver and they're at like shows uh, that I was at um, and it was really cool just to like get that aspect of it too uh, and sort of riding the rails and meeting people and bringing those influences across in, in one specific genre. Sian, were you going to add something or do you want to bring Sean in? I was, but I'm curious to hear what Sean <clears throat> Okay, sure, Sean, go for it. Just, it's speculation, but I've, I've lived also East Coast here in, in, uh, in Quebec, and this is maybe the, the, the pass down from folk, folk traditions. In the East Coast and in French Canada, they all have call and response music cultures, historically. Mm -hmm. So there's not a divide between the stage and the people. And I find and when you're talking about why Montreal is so intense, I've always felt that there is people there's I think even a Quebec politician said some quote like a society that sings together stays together. And that doesn't really hang together in the English Canadian context on this side of the country. We have like lots of scenes, but there's usually a stage and other. So anyhow, just that's that's my take on the on the Quebec music scene. You don't see it. People aren't doing call and response now, but I, I feel it. And when you get people in a bar on their own or with their family, like that still goes on over 100 percent. it's like how we relate at a micro level will really influence that like how, how do you how many folks sing at home even or as a family and the like and you know earlier we were talking about how we've sometimes the value systems here prioritize the music education oh do you have an mfa in it oh do you what qualifies or even the way we fund like Canada Arts Council, well, someone who's been active as an artist for 20 years, um, we've received uh, when doing surveys that we hear that they might get labeled an emerging artist. So it's like, how do we value our art and our artists beyond economic means is I think really important. I, I, I think to add to that too, interestingly, and I, I noticed this a lot in Ottawa growing up, but I, I think it's probably the same in Montreal. Um, it probably happens more in smaller cities, Montreal maybe being a little different, but shows that I would go to would be under the like, sort of like punk, ska, emo, hardcore subgenres, you would definitely see a lot of a variety of different types of bands. So you'd like, we had a hardcore show, but it would like, there'd be a ska band as like the second band. And traditionally, you probably wouldn't hear those. And I don't think that I ever went to a show in Toronto that had a ska band and a hardcore band because um, of the uh, amount of hardcore bands that you can pick from. Uh, but definitely when I was living in St. Catharines and in Ottawa, you would have a five band bill and there would be five different genres on the bill. Um, and I think that does a lot for connecting people and seeing things change uh, and influence and sound. Definitely. <laughs> Europe's really good at that with their fe the festivals that they have there, even things like Glastonbury and the like, where they're mixing genres a lot. Whereas here, the larger festivals tend to be very genre specific, except for like Ottawa's Blues Fest has shifted in a lot recently, has become a lot more eclectic. So there's a big shift happening in the North American market with festivals in that vein. Mm -hmm. And I, I think Ottawa, the Blues Fest is actually changing its name this year, Adam. Is that what, did you hear that? I did not hear that. Uh, I, I, I think, know it's called Blues Fest this for this season, but I don't know uh, okay. anything beyond that. I think it's like some anniversary special. But um, one thing I really appreciate about this conversation is like you know you're in a systems thinking conversation when you talk about the weather as a as a system related to the the topic of interest. So props to us for that. Um, we are past eight o'clock, so I'm just gonna like kind of 
wind down here or come to the closing part. So if anyone has any questions, you can start uh, thinking about it and we'll get to one final round of that. But uh, Zayan and Adam, let's say that I am a Music City developer and I understand you both as Music City systems thinkers. So my, I would approach you and I would ask you like, what are the what are the two to three considerations that you would give a Music City developer advice on from a systems perspective? Maybe we'll leave it with that. And if anyone has questions as well, we can kind of bring those to surface as Zayon and Adam share their uh, thoughts. Always have M and M's and the tour writer. Um, <laughs> I, I I think the importance of recognizing that there's no one size fits all strategy. And there need to be multi-pronged approaches that look at education, creating that quality supply of artists, creating quality demand for artists, quality curation mechanisms I mentioned earlier, but also looking at music more holistically beyond just an economic vehicle, but also its impact on communities, individuals, health outcomes, and you know, just recognizing music for more than what it is, for better and for worse. Mm. Nice. Yeah. I will add to that because I don't want to repeat that, but those are also on my list. Um, so I'm kind of cheating. Um, but for me, it would be get to know the city and like talk to the people. You have to talk to the people and you need to cast a wide net and understand that it's going to take a long time. Um, Cause that in means like figuring out sites of importance, like who the big players are, what's going on, get to know the community. The other is, and I will continue to plug this for the rest of my life, find ways to allow music to exist freely and in, like enhance the ability for more free music in public space in a whole variety of ways. Um, and the last one that I will add was uh, adopt agent of change policies, which means um, basically who, if it, in neighborhoods, the agent of change is whoever is coming in and sort of changing the current state of the neighborhood. So if it is sort of like a musical area with a lot of venues, if there's a developer building condos, they it's on them to soundproof appropriately uh, the housing so that people cannot complain about it. And so for people who are moving to that area to understand that this is where you're moving to, and we're going to do what we can here, but music's a priority. And on the other hand, it's if venues are opening in a largely residential area, then it's on them to soundproof and keep uh, control of what's happening there so that things can exist a lot more harmoniously. So those are, I think, my three, but I've got a billion more. Totally. In fact, you just inspired, I'm going to cheat and just throw a couple more on there because I hope sure. from the city hears this. And I think to recognize that just because something is a popular trend that is making a lot of money now doesn't mean you should follow something. When it comes to music and the arts, things of the... Uh, give the things that are unique a chance. Give the things that are a bit left of center a chance because chances are that those might be the things that resonate with people and are timeless as opposed to another rehashed song or artist that's being invested into just because they're the flavor of the week. And I think to recognize that it's not just about the music. We have to think of our transit infrastructure, transportation, our our mobility, our housing, and so much more beyond. So, you know, thanks, Zed, for, and David. For, we'll get yeah. off the box here. No problem. There's still a couple of, like, usually we try to end 8, 815, maybe push it 820. I just wanted to give time. Is there any other thoughts from the audience? Is there any questions um, that we want to party, parting comments? I had I had one thing. Maybe there's a, I'll I'll go for it, which is just one my one last thread is actually both of you, Adam. You mentioned it takes time, and Zayan, you mentioned not to jump on a trend. Maybe you both can expand on this idea, even just briefly. How how do you help someone who's doing institutional music city making? How would you help them understand how to be cognizant of the duration that they have, given some some of their own constraints? or policy windows or whatever timeframes are where there's this ten inherent tension, right? Between showing the evidence of what's happening from that, but also letting it gestate in the time periods that's needed. What's your, both of your take on time as it relates to music city development? One of them is to think of it like the stock market, right? Like if you go in expecting an immediate return, you're probably going to have a bad time. And as opposed to 
willing to stick it out, play the long game. I think that's one thing to think about with time and to recognize that, you know, we're not living in vacuums. Things will keep changing around us. Just keep an eye out on the changes in technology and the like, because, you know, you don't want to be the person who backs the wrong technology platform or format or comes in too late. There's a, a lot going on there. Well, see, it feels like that one is that ship has sailed. <laughs> <laughs> the technology. Just <laughs> <joking>. <laughs> Adam, any any thoughts on the time timelessness? Yeah. Um, well, I think that like if you're a consultancy, I mean, I, they they do this work, and I don't, so they know it a million times better than I do. But um, I think you also have to put put a couple things. One, you have to put it back on the city and ask if the, what research they've done so far, and then help them do some of that and understand like who their players are. Um, just to maybe level set and maybe express like either, oh, you've done some work and that's really great. Or you clearly know nothing about your city. We need to fix that and get people, get people on board. Um, but I think that the time aspect of it as well, and this is really jumping on the like uh, flavor of the week thing that Zayan was saying is like, what I think by taking the time, it starts to remove the industry focus of the music city aspect of it because if you focus too much on that it really is easy to completely extract the human element of it and then therefore the it's too much of a binary of like yes or no this failed or didn't fail mm -hmm. um and that that metric basically just becomes money and really like music we started music before before money was invented and music mm -hmm. makes us feel good and that is good and okay and we need that so I think that that needs to be part of the conversation. And as a, as a reminder to say, you know, sometimes we just do things because we like them. Cities are not just a place where economic exchange happens. It's not that type of site always. It's so dynamic. And if we reduce our cities to uh, the economic exchange that happens and make it so transactional, transactional in that regard, then we're not really doing anything to serve anyone. Um, and it's so easy to jump on, like, like Zan was saying, the flavor of the week and like, like the stock market example is wonderful. You're going to have a bad time if that's how you, if that's how you uh, consider it. So yeah, I think that they, they all should always be taking a very multi-pronged approach to it and look at all the entry points into like understanding cities and music cities because we could list all the things that you need to take into consideration um, to build one. But if you don't understand the human element of it and the emotional and cultural piece and the social pieces and all that, then I think it's not really going to be a fruitful venture. Mm -hmm. Beautifully framed. Like that. Yeah, that was... <laughs> That was, that was, I almost don't want to say anything further because that was very <laughs> poetically stated, Adam, and really well summarized. It's like super wonderful. So uh, to, on behalf of everyone, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Zayan. It was such a wonderful conversation. Thank you, David. Thank you for all the participants, the conversation, the questions, the reflections. I think we learned a lot about just how broad of a topic this can connect to learn, looking at music cities from a systems perspective. So that was Systems Thinking Ontario 119. What can systems thinkers learn from music city making? Um, next month is uh, we'll have number 120, uh, April 15th. Uh, Monday, April 15th, we'll send information on that. That will be about um, uh, watershed uh, stewardship. What can systems thinkers learn from watershed stewardship? So just in time for the spring vibe. So we'll send information out about that on the listings. And yeah, thank you to everyone. Have a wonderful night. Thanks so much. All right, take care. Mm -hmm.